Hi and welcome. I'm Dr. Sarah Matapia. I'm a family medicine physician and a member of the MGH Healthy Lifestyle Program. Thanks so much for joining me today. Today I'll be sharing key information related to nutrition for health. As a primary care doctor, I know that healthy eating and overall healthy lifestyle are foundational to good health and long life. A few quick notes. This webinar will be approximately 30 minutes and it will be recorded. Your video and audio are off and cannot be connected, but please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A feature or by sending a chat to hosts and panelists. The key nutrition lessons that I'll be sharing with you today are grounded in lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine studies the impact of lifestyle to prevent, treat, and even sometimes reverse chronic disease such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. Lifestyle medicine incorporates six key pillars, healthful eating, physical activity, stress management, restful sleep, nurturing social relationships, and substance avoidance. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine pillar of healthful eating emphasizes a whole foods plant-based diet, as this is the diet best supported by scientific evidence. We will discuss today what that looks like and how you can take steps, no matter what your diet looks like today, towards better nutrition. As we talk about nutrition, I want you to remember that nutrition is only one pillar. The interesting thing about the pillars is that they're all interconnected. For example, how we sleep affects our food cravings through intricate hormonal pathways in our bodies. So that while today we'll we're focusing on nutrition, it's critical to take a six pillar approach to lifestyle. And in doing so, you'll create feedback loops that strengthen all of the pillars and your overall health. So why should we care about what we eat? Often we focus on our eating because of its impact on our weight, but our food choices contribute to the function of every system in our bodies. Poor nutrition is a driving cause of heart disease, diabetes, but also conditions such as cancer, dementia, skin problems, et cetera. And so as we think about our nutrition, we need to recognize it's about so much more than our weight. It's about every cell in our bodies. In 2019, many leading scientists in lifestyle medicine came together for a summit and they published a white paper in Frontiers of Medicine. This graphic is from that paper. And it shows the three major proposed pathways through which lifestyle causes chronic disease. The first is that unhealthy lifestyle causes dysregulation of our microbiome. The human microbiome is the collection of trillions of microorganisms living in association with the human body, many of which live in the gut. Genes, our environment, and our nutrition all influence our microbiome. The microbiome consists of symbiotic microorganisms, which coexist with humans in a mutually beneficial way, as well as pathogenic microorganisms. And when the microbiome becomes unbalanced, our bodies become susceptible to disease. Unhealthy lifestyle causes epigenetic changes. We inherit genetic code and that is fixed. However, epigenetics refers to modification of gene expression. Our food and many other environmental factors add molecules to our DNA, which can cause our DNA to be expressed or suppressed. And this is a powerful pathway that can contribute to our own risks of diseases such as cancer. Lastly, unhealthy diet causes cellular stress and injury. Together, these three changes drive inflammation. And in turn, inflammation can drive further derangements in the microbiome, which can cause distinct epigenetic changes and can drive further cellular stress and injury. This positive feedback loop leads to a process wherein the inflammation becomes chronic and self-sustaining, ultimately resulting in chronic disease. So what is nutrition? Nutrition is defined as the composition of food and how the various components of food affect the body. When we talk about nutrition, we want to keep these five major components in mind. The first are macronutrients. Everyone knows about macronutrients. Macronutrients include carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and provide us with our calories. And if we use the car analogy, we can think of macronutrients as our fuel and our spare parts. 
But we need to think beyond just the macronutrients to understand nutrition. We also need to think about micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals. Vitamins and minerals serve as the keys to the ignition for our body's many functions. We also need to think about fiber. Fiber is like oil for a car. It keeps the body's functions running smoothly. Water is an essential component of nutrition. Like the car's driver, without water, our body won't function at all. And then we need to think about processing and additives. Processing and additives are like poor weather conditions. Eating food with a lot of processing and additives is like driving in a snowstorm. We have to put in significantly more effort and the conditions slow us down and put us at risk for a crash. If you try to figure out how to eat healthy by doing a Google search, you will become very confused. Nutrition in the media is often sensationalized and it attempts to communicate nutrition studies using black and white paradigms. And so as we talk about nutrition, these are two paradigm shifts that I want you to make. The first is to stop thinking about eating healthy as deprivation. Often as we work towards healthy eating, we're really primarily focused on counting calories, limiting and depriving ourselves. Instead, I want you to start thinking and looking at your food and really querying its nourishment. Every time you eat is an opportunity to choose foods that can nourish your body. Secondly, I encourage you to abandon this concept of good and bad when you're thinking about your food and move towards thinking about food choices as a spectrum. It's really our overall pattern of eating that moves us towards good nutrition. So as we're thinking about our nutrition, just like if we were going to build a wall, it is most helpful to focus on the big rocks or the core concepts. It's very easy to get lost in some of, more, some of the more minute questions. But if we focus on getting the big rocks into place, rather than just collecting a bunch of small rocks, we'll be able to successfully build our wall of strong health. So what are the big rocks of nutrition? As we build our wall, we should work on incorporating whole foods and minimally processed foods, healthy plate, plant-based foods, mindful eating, and a six pillar approach. So let's break that down a bit one by one. First, let's think about whole foods and minimally processed foods. If we go back to our car analogy, we're thinking here about processing and additives and their effect on nutrition. Food processing refers to how much of food has been changed. And this is a spectrum. On the left, we start with whole foods like this apple. Whole foods have not been processed at all. And what we know about whole foods are that they provide us with a healthy balance of vitamins, minerals, and calories. As we move towards the right, the processing increases. Level one processed foods have been slightly processed, smashed or cut, but with nothing removed, such as applesauce. Even level one processing influences the nutrition of our food. Level two processed foods have been moderately processed, such as homemade apple bread. Some of the original content has been removed and or mixed with ingredients available in a typical kitchen. Level three processed foods are ultra processed. These foods are created in a processing plant and have ingredients not found in the typical kitchen. What we know is that choosing more whole foods and less processed foods is beneficial to our nutrition. This is an interesting study that demonstrates the effects of food processing. In this study, 20 healthy volunteers were admitted to an inpatient setting for a month. All of their food was provided to them. The group was divided in half, and for the first half of the month, one of the groups received an ultra-processed diet, and the other received an unprocessed diet. Interestingly, in this study, the two diets were matched for calories, macronutrients, sugar, fat, and fiber, so the only real difference between the two diets was the level of processing. After two weeks, the group switched and received the opposite diet. What this study found was that when individuals consumed the processed diet, they consumed approximately 500 more calories per day. And over the course of the two weeks on that diet, they gained an average of over two pounds. When they were consuming the unprocessed diet, the opposite occurred and they lost an average of over two pounds. 
This small, simple experiment highlights that processing in and of itself may be a key driver to weight gain and chronic disease. And additionally, in the real world, processed food often also has more added fat, salt, and sugar, which contributes to its negative effects on nutrition. Let's talk about big rock number two and number three, healthy plate and plant-based foods. Healthy plate refers to building meals according to particular ratios and then choosing healthier foods within these ratios. This graphic is from the Harvard School of Public Health. For the healthy plate approach, you take your plate and you split it in half and you fill half your plate with vegetables and fruits. The other half of the plate is split again and a quarter of your plate you fill with whole grains and the remaining quarter with healthy proteins. Here we see the beverage of choice is water and there's an emphasis on healthy oils for cooking and dressings. This is Canada's version of healthy plate, which I like because it includes pictures of the foods. We can understand these recommendations better if we look for its implications for our car or our major nutrition components. So let's take a few minutes and get under the hood. Macronutrients are the nutrients that your body needs in large amounts, which include fat, carbohydrates, and protein. All macronutrients provide us with calories or energy. Proteins, such as chicken, turkey, lean beef, lean fish, provide four calories per gram of energy. Proteins also provide us with building blocks called amino acids that our body needs to make its own proteins. Carbohydrates, such as grains, pasta, breads, cereals, fruits and vegetables, these provide four calories per gram. Carbohydrates also provide us with fiber and micronutrients. Fats, such as butter, ghee, and oils, provide nine calories per gram, more than the other two macronutrients. Fats are used by the body to build cell membranes. But one important point is that most foods are not made up of only one type of macronutrient, which can be visualized here in this Venn diagram. Many animal products such as red meat, fatty fish, and dairy are comprised largely of both proteins and fats. Whereas low fat dairy products and plant-based proteins often are comprised of both proteins and carbohydrates. Baked treats, fries, and chips are largely comprised of fats and carbs. And pizza, the quintessential American food, is comprised of all three. Okay, what about micronutrients? Micronutrients are vitamins, which are organic, and minerals, which are inorganic, that are necessary for our body to run. Micronutrients do not provide any calories. They are best obtained through our food. Fruits, vegetables, and whole grains are rich in micronutrients, and varying your diet or eating the rainbow will ensure that you're getting ample micronutrients. Even having one micronutrient deficiency can cause a chronic disease. For example, vitamin D deficiency can lead to osteoporosis and rickets, and vitamin C deficiency can lead to scurvy. Water is also considered an essential micronutrient. It's best for water to be one's beverage of choice for optimal nutrition. These are two studies that show how common micronutrient deficiencies are in the US population. In these studies, we see that almost all Americans are deficient in potassium and fiber, and eating more fruits and vegetables is the best way to improve this. Okay, now let's look at fiber. Fiber is essential to good nutrition. There are two kinds of fiber, soluble fiber, which dissolves in water, and insoluble fiber, which does not dissolve in water. As we've discussed, the best sources of fiber are fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Soluble fiber mixes with partially digested food in the stomach and in the small intestine, and it entraps sugar and cholesterol and slows the absorption into the body. This is part of the reason why getting fruits and vegetables onto the plate is important for nutrition, 
the fiber and the fruits and the vegetables influence how your body processes the rest of your food. Insoluble fiber is food for the gut microbiome, contributing to a balanced microbiota. Insoluble fiber is also important for regularity. It prevents constipation and promotes good gut health. So as we come back to our healthy plate, you can understand the role of fruits and vegetables. These foods provide us with critical micronutrients and fiber. If you remember on our healthy plate, there are also suggestions for types of whole grains and proteins to emphasize. These recommendations are aimed at targeting our big rocks, minimizing food processing, getting our needed macronutrients and micronutrients, and focusing on plant-based foods. So let's talk in a little more detail about the spectrum of foods for each of our macronutrients. All right, to make this a little bit more fun, uh, let's have you try your hand at some questions. Think to yourself, is this statement true or false? To lose weight, I should cut carbohydrates. Answer here is false. Carbohydrates have a really bad reputation. So I think it's helpful to back up and remind ourselves what we mean when we say carbohydrates. So we think about carbohydrates, we need to incorporate the concept of processing. As you remember, good nutrition emphasizes whole foods and less processed foods. What that means for carbohydrates is choosing whole grains as opposed to processed grains. In processed grain products, the bran and the kernel are stripped out, if you look at the image here in the center of the slide. And we are left with just the starch. With much of the fiber removed in this way, the carbohydrate is broken down by the body more quickly. And that can raise the blood sugar levels quickly as well, contributing to weight gain and hunger. We also lose key micronutrients when we process our grains. In their natural state growing in the fields, whole grains are the entire seed of the plant. And whole grains are what we want to emphasize in our diet. So this slide demonstrates our carbohydrate choice continuum. This slide is borrowed from Med Instead of Meds, which is a collaborative group of nutritionists and health professionals from NC State University and NC Division of Public Health. The left-hand side of the slide shows carbohydrates we want to choose more in our diet, including fruits, vegetables, and legumes. We also should choose more unprocessed whole grains and lightly processed whole grains without added sugar. We want to choose less of the processed refined grains, and we want to try to avoid food and beverages high in added sugar. Okay, our next true or false question, think to yourself, meat is crucial in the diet to provide protein. This is false. What we see is that we are able to get plenty of protein in our diet using plant-based proteins. We can better understand the nutritional value of proteins by thinking about the whole package. This slide is adapted from the Harvard School of Public Health. We can compare what we get here from four different sources of protein, sirloin, ham, salmon, and lentils. If you look here, we can compare by macronutrients, micronutrients, fiber, and any additives or extras. With sirloin, you are getting a significant amount of protein, but also a significant amount of saturated fat. We'll talk in a minute about saturated fats, which have been shown to have some health harming properties and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Ham includes a significant amount of sodium, and sodium is an unwanted additive that contributes to high blood pressure. Salmon is a good source of protein with a smaller amount of saturated fat, and it also has a bonus. It includes omega-3 fatty acids, which have beneficial properties for health. And lastly, lentils are a good source of protein, also unrefined carbohydrates, and they have the added benefit of being a good source of fiber. This slide shows the protein choice continuum. As we are choosing our proteins, we wanna choose more beans, nuts, and seeds, 
fish and seafood, and white meat poultry. We want to choose eggs and less processed dairy in moderation. And we want to choose less dark meat poultry, processed dairy, and higher fat meats. We want to try to avoid highly processed meats such as bacon and cold cuts. Okay, last question, fat raises cholesterol. Answer here is it depends. So what we know about fats is that less processed fats are best. And this is consistent with the key lesson we've been discussing today that emphasizes whole foods and less processed foods. Fats can be further categorized based on their chemical structure as trans fats, saturated fats, or unsaturated fats. And you can see this visualized here with the pictures of the actual structural compounds. Trans fats have one double bond in a trans configuration. What we know about trans fats is that it's best to avoid them. They have health harming effects and there is strong consensus about this. In fact, there has been much regulation to try to eliminate trans fats in our diets. And so luckily there are fewer and fewer of these in our foods. It's also best to avoid ultra processed fats which you'll find in many fried foods and many junk foods. With respect to saturated fats versus unsaturated fats, many societies, including the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and the American Heart Association, recommend choosing unsaturated fats over saturated fats. Whether saturated fats are health harming in and of themselves is a bit controversial. However, what is clear is that when you replace saturated fats with unsaturated fats, there are health benefits. Whenever we are making food choices, it's important to consider just not, not just whether you choose to eat something, but what you will be replacing it with. In the past, in the American diet, we often replaced saturated fats with refined carbohydrates. And this did not improve our nutrition. But what we know now is that replacing saturated fats with unsaturated fats can help improve our nutrition and health. Amongst the unsaturated fats, we see that omega-3 fatty acids are particularly beneficial because our bodies cannot make these themselves. Omega-3 fatty acids have been shown to have anti-inflammatory properties. And so specifically incorporating omega-3 fatty acids into your diet with foods such as salmon, walnuts, and chia and flax seeds can be beneficial. Okay, so that whirlwind tour of the macronutrients brings us back to this healthy plate template. Focusing on this template to build our meals is one of the easiest ways to work towards good nutrition. And so to review with healthy plate, we wanna take half our plate and fill it with fruits and vegetables. We then wanna take a quarter of our plate and incorporate whole grains. Whole grains are grains like whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, brown rice. We want to be limiting our refined grains like white rice and white bread. In our remaining quarter, we want to choose healthy proteins. And that means plant-based proteins such as beans, nuts, and seeds, as well as fish and poultry. We want to limit our red meat and our cheese and our dairy. And we want to avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meats. We also want to have water be our drink of choice. We want to use healthy oils, and those are the unsaturated oils, um, like olive oil and canola oil for cooking on salad and at the table. As we're wrapping up, I do want to acknowledge that part of what makes food choices so difficult is our food environment. We are often surrounded by processed foods. And when this is the norm, it takes a huge amount of effort to make and sustain change. This image from pediatrician and artist, Dr. Susan Prescott, illustrates that part of the important work to promote health needs to be also to restore connectivity and responsibility for our environment. Lastly, let's briefly touch on these two last big rocks of nutrition. Mindfulness and eating. Mindfulness is a type of meditation in which you focus on being intensely aware of what you're sensing and feeling in the moment 
without interpretation or judgment. And so mindfulness, when we think of how this could relate to eating, um, it means really attending to the experience, noticing the smell, the texture, the taste of your foods. It means slowing down, trying just to eat without the TV or driving or other distractions. It includes acknowledging the responses to food. Do you like it? Do you dislike it? Are you neutral? Um, without necessarily passing judgment. And it means becoming more aware of physical hunger and satiety cues to really help guide your decisions to begin and end eating and hopefully help to avoid overeating or stress eating. Lastly, as we talked about in the beginning, healthy eating is only one pillar of lifestyle medicine. And it's important to take a six pillar approach. This means also working to stay physically active, manage your stress, avoid risky substances, improve your sleep, and form and maintain strong social relationships. This picture here shows your metabolism. Why is your metabolism important? Well, this is where every single chemical reaction is happening. Everything is made right here. Your bones, your hormones, your neurotransmitters, even things like your personality, your mood, and your happiness are being made here. Here's where we transform food into us. And in order to run a healthy metabolism and prevent disease, we require the perfect balance and equilibrium that only unprocessed whole foods can provide us with. And so the take home message is not to compromise your health, to work on eating mostly natural whole foods. And remember your brain and body are counting on you. So there are some places you can go to learn more. There are some websites here at the top, including the American Heart Association, the Harvard School of Public Health, our own lifestyle medicine program page, Med Instead of Meds, and Boston Healthiest. Additionally, these books, In Defense of Food and This Is Your Brain on Food, have great content. And Forks Over Knives has both uh, website information as well as a movie that you can stream. Do you want to let folks know about two additional upcoming webinars? Um, the first is around reducing holiday stress, and that will be given by Dr. Jacob Mursky on Wednesday, December 22nd at 1 p.m. And the second is on goal setting for sustainable behavior change. That will be Thursday, January 13th at 6 by Dr. Katie Engels, one of our health and wellness coaches. Just want to say thanks so much for joining, and we welcome your feedback. Thank you, Dr. Matathia. That was very informative and a lot of really great information. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. So the first one is going into the holiday season, what are some tips for people when thinking about nutrition? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so certainly learning about some of these big rocks and these core, core topics is helpful, but then how do you translate them into action? It can be harder. And particularly around the holiday season when you know we're surrounded um, by perhaps foods towards that right-hand side of the spectrum. And so the first thing I would say is just to kind of pause and make a game plan for yourself. Um, little, being a little bit proactive and sort of thinking through how you're gonna approach different situations can be very helpful. And also talking with your friends and family about your intentions to create accountability um, and actually perhaps even get them on board. Um, and the last thing I would say is that mindful eating can be very, very helpful um, in scenarios where you may be uh, a little bit more susceptible to, to overeating, um, really kind of slowing down and experiencing your food, I think um, can, can be a key strategy around the holidays. Fantastic. And a follow-up question to that is, how could someone get started with making some of these changes? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so I guess I would say two, two things. Um, one is that as folks are working on making changes, what we find is that using a goals-based goal approach is very helpful. And as folks are making goals, one of the things to really narrow in on is to make them what we call SMART, um, S-M-A-R-T. Um, SMART stands for um, specific, 
measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. And what this gets at is that you want to be really as granular as you can with what your goals are. Rather than saying, I want to eat better, you want to be specific. Well, I want to put vegetables on my plate five nights a week. Um, and then to use that as a guiding principle to then say, well, what do I need to do to get vegetables on my plate? You know, I need to make a plan. What am I going to eat? What am I going to get the store? What am I going to do my food prep? Um, and so really setting yourself up with those SMART goals can be really helpful. The second piece I would say is that as you make these goals, you want to set aside some time for yourself to reevaluate and see how you're doing. And you want to be careful, right? If you find that you haven't made any progress when you reevaluate, you don't want to be hard on yourself. Behavior change takes time and it is challenging. But by setting aside some time where you'll be doing that reevaluation, it gives you a chance to check in, adjust the goal if you need to, and think about what got in the way and how can I shift things around to hopefully be more successful. Those are really great tips. So thank you for walking us through that. And again, thank you for a phenomenal presentation. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here.